welcome everybody to this book forum to celebrate Professor Kent Roach's book, Remedies for a Human Rights Violation, a two-track approach to supranational and national law. I'm Rebecca Cook. I'm the interim director of the International Human Rights Program here at the Law Faculty of the University of Toronto. I'm co-hosting this forum with Cheryl Milne, the director of the Asper Center on Constitutional Law, Ashley Major, a researcher program, a research associate in the International Human Rights Program. Ashley is going to start this forum with a land acknowledgement. Ashley. Thanks, Rebecca. Hello all and welcome. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and to share this forum with you today. Cheryl Milne is now going to explain the logistics of this Zoom meeting. Thank you. Um, so we are in a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar. So we just ask that people um, mute themselves and uh, disable the camera just to avoid distractions. If you want to highlight the person who's speaking, just go to the top of right hand side of your screen and you can click on speaker view. And so that the person who is, is speaking um, will, um, will take up the, the majority of your screen. It will reduce the distractions. We will be monitor monitoring the chat. Um, throughout. So if you have questions um, for um, Professor Roach or any of the speakers, um, you can add, add them into the chat, chat and I will be keeping a speakers list and we can come to them if we have time at the end um, for people to ask their questions. So back to you, Rebecca. I'm pleased to present our wonderful panel who will be commenting on Kent's book for about 10 minutes each. We're going to start with Dean Robert Sharp and former Justice Emeritus of the Ontario Court of Appeal. We'll then proceed with Professor Brenda Gunn, who's the Academic and Research Director at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation at the University of Manitoba. Third, will Julian Huertas Cardenas, who's a doctoral student here at the University of Toronto, working on the Inter-American Human Rights System. And we'll conclude with Payam Akhavan, senior fellow at Massey College, a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague and a visiting professor here at the law faculty. We will then have a reply from the author, Kent Roach, and open it up to questions, as Cheryl said. So, Dean Sharp, over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, it's wonderful to have a chance to talk about Kent's uh, quite remarkable book. Uh, remarkable, I think, for several reasons. Uh, originality and freshness in the approach, the breadth uh, and depth of the research in what I consider to be a neglected field, that of remedies, um, and important insights in how to best uh, deal with uh, human rights violations through remedial law. And of course, the other very significant feature of Kent's book is it demonstrates how our understanding of remedies and law generally can be enriched by drawing on uh, the sub by examining the subject through the land multiple lenses of domestic, uh, supranational, uh, and international law. So my approach will obviously be influenced by my background, and my there are two sides to my background that are relevant uh, for this uh, for this talk. One is. Uh, uh, I used to be a, a legal scholar. I still try to do a bit of legal scholarship. And in that capacity, I, I've, I share uh, Kent's longstanding interest in remedies and constitutional law. My first academic project was a thesis and a book on habeas corpus, one of the great remedies to vindicate human rights. I then did a book uh, on injunctions. And I agree with Kent that despite the obvious importance of remedies, it's been a rather neglected subject. I guess that's one of the reasons I was attracted to doing it. Um, it sort of gets lost in the, in the borderland between substantive rights and procedure. So that's my scholarly side. On the other side, of course, I spent 25 years as a judge, uh, trial and uh, appellate judge, uh, courts of general jurisdiction. And as I'll explain, as a common law judge in the common law tradition, you're strongly focused on the facts of your case and decide and, and 
you know that your job really is to come up with a just decision and an effective remedy. So I'm acutely aware of the challenges of crafting an appropriate uh, remedy. And I'm acutely aware of the fact that as a judge, I did not always seem to have the tools I needed to carry out that, that job. And Kent's book is really about that problem, the problem of that worst remedial failure, uh, at best remedial imperfection, it seems. Um, and uh, that's uh, th those two things you dread as a judge, failure or, or inadequacy, failing to give the litigants a proper uh, remedy, failing to live up to your public duty to vindicate the rule of law. So I'm going to focus my comments, obviously, on the two central themes of Kent's book and what they would have meant, what they mean to me as a former judge. First of all, the true track, the two track approach. Track one, traditional judicial focus on remedying past wrongs, where courts play a dominant role in providing meaningful remedies. That's what courts do. That's what courts are supposed to be good at. And track two, shifting to the more international law fo focus that Kent drives from more international law, preventing future wrongs, this idea of dialogic engagement between the courts and the government or public institutions to avoid future harm. Uh, play courts where courts have a role, but courts have to realize they can't do it on their, on their own. So that, that, that essential two-track strategy. And then the second major theme that I see from this book, the Declaration Plus Remedy, which is really Kent's device uh, to permit courts to move safely from track one to track two. Uh, and, and so that's the, that's my approach. So the two track theory uh, uh, points out that uh, the, the, the track one focus on the past and righting wrongs from the past is necessary, but problematic. It's problematic, it's, it's necessary because as, as I said, that's what, what judges do. That's what the task of a judge, but it's problematic in that the remedies often either over or undercompensate or just simply routinely fail to prevent future wrongs. Uh, the most common remedy for, for a wrong, common law remedy for a wrong is compensation. Well, obviously when we turn to human rights, that is less than satisfactory. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard to put a dollar value on a human right. And so it's bound to be, there's bound to be some kind of remedial failure if you're just, uh, if you're just compensating. Remedy, human rights can't be bought and sold and they don't, have a, they don't really have a price. Uh, if we turn into to the criminal process, um, remedies may seem to overcompensate. The, uh, the, the typical remedy in the Canadian uh, constitutional law uh, for violations is either a stay of proceedings or exclusion of evidence. Um, that may seem to give the victim of the wrong too much and may actually not enhance the other side of things, which is preventing future wrongs. It's questionable how far that, that achieves that secondary goal. Uh, striking down a law, uh, uh, particularly laws that are under-inclusive, uh, will, will not remedy the situation for the person who didn't, who didn't get the benefit. And it may uh, certainly interfere with legit, the legitimate part of the law that does pass constitutional muster uh, and, and deprive the public of the benefit. So we have, we have a, a, a basic problems to contend with, even on track, track one. And when we start to think about track two and preventing the future, those problems become even more acute. Track two's focus on prevention of wrongs and systemic improvement of, and harm prevention are certainly preferable from the perspective of full remedial protection of human rights. We focus on what do we have to do to make sure this doesn't happen. Whereas on track one, we're focused on what do we have to do to, to vindicate or uh, to remedy the problem that this individual rights sufferer has, uh, has, has had inflicted upon him or her. So track two's focus shifts us to this idea of prevention, full remedial prevention, but judges tend to view it as problematic. And I'll try to explain why. Um, achieving systemic change is a multidimensional and complex exercise, which is very difficult to manage in a judicial proceeding. 
a judge typically has one case, one set of facts, and doesn't have the full picture. Judges, it requires judges to engage in ju the judicial design of public institutions, a task for which they are ill-suited. And when I think of my own experience as first a scholar and then a judge, it, it, it tells me something, whether it'll tell you anything, I'll leave it to you. But as a scholar, I, when I'm free to write about remedies as I saw fit, I, I think I was quite well disposed uh, towards what we might call relatively activist judicial remedies in human rights cases. Judges taking on a situation in which human rights were being violated, taking a hands-on approach and making sure that that didn't happen again. Just seemed like a good thing to do. As a judge with the responsibility of deciding cases, things started to me to look a little bit different. And I have to confess, I was much more comfortable staying on track one, even though I was aware of track one's, uh, track one's limitations. When it comes to engaging in structural form to prevent future wrongs, things start to look more problematic. As I say, the judge is kind of a prisoner of the facts of the case before uh, him or her. You know all about that case. You know how you want to decide that case for that litigant, but it's much more complex and much more uncertain to know what's the best way to reform this institution that has produced the wrong and that, uh, that, that uh, the, the wrong that you are being asked uh, to remedy. Des designing or reforming public institutions is complex and judges and the judicial process are not designed to cope or deal with that, uh, that complexity. So let's look at the remedies. That, what, what do we have in the, in the judicial toolbox to deal with that situation? We have two things that we can do if we're looking, talking, looking towards the future. One is declarations and the other is mandatory orders usually in the form of injunctions. This is at least in the common law traditions. Declarations are great. Judges are very well equipped to grant declarations regarding human rights uh, violations. Uh, and the words say, this is wrong, this should not happen. And the remedial advantage of the declaration is the judge remains squarely within the bounds of the judge's institutional competence. The remedial disadvantage is clearly what happens if the institution fails to reform the procedure. What happens if the institution fails to pay any attention to the judicial pronouncement? And I think judges have a dread of rendering a judicial pronouncement. That brings the whole process into disrepute uh, and uh, it puts the integrity of the court on the line, so to speak. So in the, the declaration is an attractive remedy in the sense that it falls squarely within the, 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 the judge's strike zone, if you like, but there's a risk uh, that if, if there's nothing more, uh, nothing's gonna happen. Um, we're used in Canada, we're typically used to having governments obey declarations, but there are certainly many cases, and Kent deals with them, where uh, the governments have been very slow or simply refuse. And the two classic examples would be minority school rights and uh, prison reform, especially with solitary, the solitary confinement, where there's just a steadfast refusal uh, to comply. So that's the, the declaration. The second tool in this toolbox goes sort of the other end, and that's the, the injunction, especially the mandatory injunction, sometimes called structural injunction, to in effect give detailed instructions as to how to, an a, a, a errant public institution uh, is to, uh, be, to be run. Now, as I say, it's easy to say what you can't do, can't do this. It's not so easy to say this is how you should manage to avoid that. It's much more difficult to say, this is how you should do that. There will be many different ways of avoiding the wrong and choosing from among, the, among those different ways involves administrative, financial, and other considerations that are simply not within the knowledge or the capacity of the judge. So uh, as I say, one thing to declare that the, 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 the situation is wrong, quite another to say, these are the steps you should take uh, to put it right. And Kent's solution to that dilemma, that problem, is the Declaration Plus. It recognizes the institutional capacities on both sides of the equation, the judicial capacity to pronounce on rights, to remedy individual wrongs, and the government's capacity 
to design and manage effectively and efficiently public institutions. So it and he and he what the Declaration Plus does, if you it sort of gives that gives the judge a safe way to get off track one and get onto track track two. The Declaration Plus, the idea is that the judge makes the declaration and retains jurisdiction to monitor the institutional change. It's a kind of a nudging strategy. It's using dialogue and persuasion. It gives the, the institution a steady push in the direction of reform. It holds the institution accountable if it fails to act. But the, this is the important point. It leaves it up to the institution to reform itself within the broad parameters that are defined by the, by the human right, the law of the human rights principle. Uh, keeps both the judge and the institution within their areas of competence and expertise. So it certainly pushes the court out of the comfort of what you might call one-time litigation, where you simply hear a case, make an order, and that's the end of it. Court judges like that, they resist being pushed out of it. It definitely pushes them out of that comfort zone, but at the same time avoids the risk of a hollow judicial pronouncement that will come if, if the judge simply gives a declaration. Kent shows us how uh, this idea has been used by foreign and supranational courts. It's gained, I would call it very grudging acceptance by our Supreme Court in the minority school situation, but it still, it, it did get a five to four uh, check mark uh, as, as an acceptable uh, remedy. So the book, I think, makes a strong case for the Declaration Plus as a technique to escape remedial failure that will flow if we, re if we refuse to get off track one but it gives us a way to do that without falling into the trap implicit in track two of becoming mired in institutional design for which courts are ill-equipped. Thanks. Thank you, Dean Sharp. Now we'll move to Professor Brenda Gunn. Hi, good morning. It's still morning in Winnipeg. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today on this wonderful panel. It's one of those moments that you stop and look at your life and go, how did I manage to be on this panel with these people? And I feel like I'm maybe hitting above, uh, above my weight. I'm sitting here, so I hope I can hold my own. I'm really grateful to be speaking to you today from Treaty 1 territory and the homeland of the Métis, my traditional territory. I am Métis, I'm a citizen of the Manitoba Métis Federation, and my family comes from just north of Winnipeg where I currently reside. So my work has really focused on pushing for greater conformity between international human rights law and the rights of Indigenous peoples. Um, and domestic law. And so that's going to be the framework that I use when I speak to Kent Roach's wonderful book. And um, I think we've had a great overview of, of, the pro of, of what the book is proposing and I'll try not to repeat any of that, but I'll kind of bring in my comments um, from the perspective of my work. And I will say that from the first line of the book, it hits home for me and my work. So the book starts with saying that we live in a world rich with rights. Alas, we live in a world poor in remedies. And I think that is very much true when we speak about Indigenous people's rights. As many of you know, we have the protection of Aboriginal and treaty rights in our Canadian constitution which of course is meant to be the highest law of the land. However, what we've seen over the last couple of decades is that protection has not led to a robust realization of the rights of Indigenous peoples. And far too often when we've gone to courts to seek recognition of our rights, what we've ended up with is a case and a test that suggests the governments can justifiably infringe our rights and thus leading to very few protections of our rights and very few remedies when rights have been recognized. 
And so I think his contribution is significant because of the way it pushes us to pay more attention to the remedies in order to make the rights recognized in the Constitution in international human rights law more meaningful. It's also, from my perspective, a very striking book because of the turning to international human rights law and the approaches used there to suggest that we have something to learn in domestic law. And that has been the approach for many Indigenous peoples, where feeling frustrated um, and failing to see any recognition in, international, in domestic law, we've turned to international human rights law. But I agree with his statement that even in international human rights law and domestic law, that we seem to run out of steam for remedies. And we see this in international human rights law cases. James Zanaya, who led one of the groundbreaking cases on the land rights of the Magna in Nicaragua, you know, he tells the stories of the work to bring that case through and the challenges to get the recognition of the rights and the real the recognition of the violation of the um, the sorry of the violation of land rights. And then all of a sudden, you know, being somewhere and getting a call, okay, what's the remedy and scrambling, right? Like, and this is a story he has publicly told and perhaps when I was a student at U of T and that recognition that, oh yeah, now what do we want, right? What do we, what are we looking for? And so part of Kent's work here, I think is really critical because it gets us to shift our focus a little bit to really keep remedies front and center in the work. And this reminds me of a story that Justice Tony Mandaman also has shared about his criticism of criminal law. And he was talking about his experience of working in criminal courts in Alberta and how it really did not match with the community's understanding of criminal law. And so Justice Mindaman talked about the criminal process being all about trying to prove that someone is guilty. And so you spend all of this time on guilt or innocence and then a little bit on sentencing. And he was sharing from his Indigenous perspective, from an Anishinaabe perspective, from working with Sutina, that from the Indigenous perspective, the process is about this much about guilt or innocent. And this is why he was saying many Indigenous peoples uh, plead guilty because that's what we are taught to accept responsibility. And then from an Indigenous justice perspective, you would spend all the time on the remedy. And so part of what Kent's approach is doing, again, resonates with me because it aligns with how I've been raised to focus on repairing the harm and not just figuring out that right or wrong bit. I particularly like from my personal perspective that he turned to international human rights law because as I said, that's been the focus of my work. So it's nice to see someone as esteemed as Kent Roach agreeing that that's a good way to go and then doing the work to come up with the theoretical framework for that translation to happen. And so I've also done some work looking at how we can take international human rights remedies and apply them in the domestic context, particularly thinking of um, violations of Aboriginal title and can we think about expanding our notion of compensation beyond just monetary compensation to maybe start to include some of those broader principles of reparations in international human rights law. And then again, in the uh, piece that I have in the University of Toronto Law Journal. And I just want to highlight um, beyond that sort of theoretical, or real practical, some of the examples that we've seen for remedies in that international human rights level, because I think it emphasizes the importance of what Kent is pushing for here. Because under international human rights law, mostly through the inter-American human rights system, Indigenous peoples have been able to not only prove that they have rights to their traditional lands and territories, but have been able to get remedies that really protect those rights. And so the range of remedies that I point out in my piece talk about the state needing to demarcate, delimit, and title the lands, to change domestic land laws 
to protect Indigenous peoples' rights to their lands, territories, and resources according to Indigenous peoples' laws on those lands. There's been restrictions of activities and any development practices in the area until the demarcation is complete. A need to rehabilitate any lands that have been uh, damaged. An ordering of human rights training for government officials so that government officials understand the rights so that they're better able to protect and respect those rights. Then we have a little bit of financial compensation but much of the compensation focusing on the development funds for the community to ensure that that nation is able to succeed. There's also almost always an obligation to publicize the decision so that people in the country understand and for the community themselves to understand what the violation has been and what needs to be done to repair it. And then, of course, the um, obligation for ongoing supervision. And of course, this is also, um, as already noted, has been picked up in this work. And so I really commend Kent's work for taking these principles and coming up with that framework that we can use to start to bring that international human rights perspective in the domestic courts. I know I'm out of time, but I want to try to make two really quick points. And I don't know if I can talk much faster than this. So I wanted to highlight some an idea that's not well formed yet, but I was thinking about this two track approach and why it was resonating so much with me. This idea of, of a remedy that's specific to the litigant and something that's more systemic. And there's something in this proposal that I think better reflects the challenges that Indigenous peoples have faced because so much of our rights have been collective rights. And that has been a hurdle that we've seen in domestic law, this sort of recognition for Canadian law to move beyond the individual to think about collective rights has been such a challenge. And John Burroughs has talked a lot about this in his early career about how we move past that individual to collective thinking. And so there's something in this two track approach that I think um, allows us to start thinking beyond violations of rights at that individual level, which so much of Canadian law has focused, to sort of think about how do collectives experience violations of rights, and then how do we protect those collective rights. And, and I'm sorry that that thought isn't better formed, but maybe Kent can do it because he's the, he's the brilliant thinker here that he can sort of help me kind of plug those two um, missing pieces, right? That if the harm is collective, then that reparation needs to be collective. And we have the collective that's specific to the indi in Indigenous peoples, but recognizing that a violation of human rights law is also a harm to broader Canadian society. And then the last point I wanna make in, if, in the 30 additional seconds, if I can get them, is just an area that I'm a little cautious about in his proposal and in his approach which is the idea of introducing this notion of proportionality into the remedies process. And it's not one that I am yet convinced about because proportionality has been used in the Section 35 jurisprudence to undermine Indigenous peoples and their rights. We are constantly told at every turn that we are supposed to sacrifice ourselves, sacrifice our women, sacrifice our children, for the greater good. And we have never in the Canadian history experienced any of that good. And I'm not being overly rhetorical in this. It's really practical. When we think of the ways in which Indigenous peoples are supposed to sacrifice our lands, sacrifice our connection for the economic development of Canada, yet we don't see the benefits we don't have running water in our communities. We don't even have electricity when they're flooding our lakes. And so international human rights law has been so valuable because we are not supposed to sacrifice the individual for this broader good. And so I'm, I'm cautious, I'm concerned that by introducing proportionality back into the remedies process, 
we might take away some of the key successes and the best lever that Indigenous peoples have had to really ensure that we no longer have to sacrifice ourselves for the Canadian good. So I think I'll leave my comments there. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Kent, for this great book. Thank you, Professor Gunn. Uh, Professor Gunn mentioned an article that she did in the University of Toronto Law Journal, as did um, Dean Sharp. That's a 1919 uh, supplement that Kent hosted, and it has some very foundational articles that in some ways led to this book. Um, now we're going to go to Julian Uertes, um, our JSD student here at the University of Toronto. Julian, over to you. Thank you, Professor Cook, and thank, hello to everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy and grateful to, to be here. Um, so, well, first of all, uh, this is a, a fantastic book, and, and I will develop some ideas or, or focus on, on some ideas. As Professor Cook said at the beginning, uh, my, my focus is the Inter American system of human rights, and I'm exploring or studying the resistance from domestic courts to the Inter American Court of Human Rights. So this is the issue. So enforcement of remedies of the decisions of the Inter-American Court and focus mostly on Venezuela, which is uh, it's, it's not a democracy anymore, but it's still it's a lot of these the, the, the frameworks and the proposals developed in the book can be applied even to uh, situations involving um, non-democracies or authoritarian contexts. But I, will, I want to begin by um, highlighting uh, our panelists have done so, but highlighting that the what I take as the main contribution of the book is that it provides us with some language and frameworks to analyze, to make sense of a topic that, as Professor Sharp said, has been neglected, has only been occasionally studied by scholars, by scholars in, in domestic law and international law. I can only comment from comment from international law. So I, I will focus on the law of judicial remedies in international human rights law then the two-track two approach to remedies, and third, the remedial failure and compliance. compliance. So um, on the first idea, um, in international law, we don't have a comprehensive law. I mean, we have some law for general law for remedies, but it is very recent. Um, in the 1980s, Christian Gray, a scholar from Cambridge, asked precisely about it. And, is there any law, international law for remedies? And the answer at the time was no. Now we have the 2001 International Law Commission's articles on the international responsibility of the state, uh, which one section deals with remedies, but in general, not, not only for human rights, but in general for human rights violations. Um, we also have the treaties, of course, the ICCPR, we have the regional convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, the, the American Convention on Human Rights, but they are still very general. They mention remedies, they refer to remedies, but they are very general. So um, what do we have? We have uh, in international law, we have decisions by international tribunals. We have some decisions by the ICJ related to human rights in cases like uh, Diallo case, um, Abina case, um, and Lagrange. The, these are Paul, these are not exactly human rights cases, cases, but they involve human rights, they're related to human rights. We have uh, human rights monitoring bodies like the Human Rights Committee. We have the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which, which is different from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And of course, we have the three regional human rights courts, the European, Inter-American, and African. Uh, but one common criticism um, to the regional courts and, and our international uh, institutions is the discretion. And I haven't considered uh, uh, Professor uh, Brenda Gunn's uh, criticism of proportionality, but uh, and maybe I don't have the elements to, to, to comment on that criticism, but I think that besides or, or putting aside the, all the issues uh, with indigenous uh, rights in, in Canada, I think that in general proportionality gives um, a powerful tool to assess remedies in human rights law, at least from the, from, from, from the field that I know, the inter American human rights system. He would place a burden on courts, um, on human rights courts, but also it could protect those human rights courts from criticism from governments, which always say that 
uh, or many times say that courts, uh, human rights courts, are overstepping their mandate. They are uh, ignoring the principle of subsidiarity. They they say they say too much. Uh, that's what the government, some governments, say about the, the remedies of, of human rights courts. So the principle of proportionality, if we take that as a test. Uh, it can structure the, the conversation and the criticism and could, could shift the burden of, of justification uh, from the court to the government when it wants to criticize a, a remedy uh, ordered by a by human rights court. So I think it, it could be very helpful. Um, so this is the just very quickly the, 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 the first idea with the, with the law of, of, of and for remedies in international human rights law. Then um, we have the, the central idea of the book, of course, we, which is the two-track approach to remedies. Um, and the book presents international human rights courts as examples of the two-track approach, and that is right. And particularly the Inter-American Court has been much more creative than the European Court. Now, the downside of this creativity is the lack of compliance or lower compliance uh, with, with um, these decisions by the Inter-American Court. They're very creative, they're very ambitious. In the, in the genus cases, Professor, Professor Gunn knows more, but um, maybe one or a few cases, there has been a full compliance. A lot of them, states do not comply with those remedies, which are like very, would be great if, if states comply with them and enforce them, but many times they don't. So it's like, um, that, that, that's the situation uh, with many cases and many remedies from the Inter-American Court. Um, so we have both uh, types of, of remedies in, in the Inter-American Court. We have interim, uh, we have uh, first track or, or or individual remedies. We have uh, systemic or guarantees of non of non repetition. And within the first category, the the individual remedies, we have well the typical remedies after the the merits decision, the the, the section on, on remedies. Uh, the court, the Inter-American Court, usually addresses the the victims of the case so it's not it does it's not very common and i haven't seen that uh, in a decision like in the section of, of remedies ignoring the, the victims of the case it always addresses the, the victim uh, of, of the case and sometimes like around 25 percent of, of the, the of its decisions it orders um, guarantees of non-repetition or systemic measures but within the individual the first track um type of remedies. We have the, the typical remedies after the merits decision, and we have the interim remedies, which is a very interesting practice by the Inter-American Court. Those interim remedies or provisional measures in the case of the Inter-American Court are mandatory according to the court. The court has formulated them as mandatory, and some countries like Colombia, uh, I'm from Colombia, have accepted the binding character of those interim remedies, which is, and, and they can be very helpful. They can, I mean, they can be very important. For, for potential victims or victims or people who are under a situation of human rights abuse. Um, so the, these interim remedies can last long, can take many years uh, to, to enforce them, uh, but states have the obligation to report to the court on the enforcement of, of these interim remedies. And, and the court has, the American court has ordered professional measures to protect journalists, political candidates, witnesses, members of indigenous communities, human rights advocates, prisoners, like a broad range of, of people, of, of victims or potential victims. And here the idea is not to solve the situation um, of potential human rights violation, of course, but to prevent irreparable damage or harm. So this is the, this is the, the, the focus, the approach of the Inter-American Court. They, and it has been, in general, I think, a very successful, again, the issue of, of enforcement, but the states tend to comply more with interim remedies than the, the, general, the general decisions, the general judgments. Um, and I think it's, it's one of the great developments uh, by the Inter-American Court. And we have the systemic uh, measures. Mm, it's around, as I said before, 25%. They're found in around 25% of the cases of the Inter-American Court. And the court has been has been very ambitious uh, with the systemic um, remedies. Um, here again, proportionality could help rein some of that creativity, uh, because 
it's I mean sometimes it feels like the American court wants to solve the very big problems of Latin American states, which of course it makes sense and that's the mandate of the American court. But I think it has to be more careful with the political situation of the states um, because sometimes it, it ends up uh, in, in non-compliance or get the states just ignoring the, those remedies. Um, but also it's very common to find this um, second track of remedies because of the design of the Inter American system of human rights. We have the court, but we also have the American Commission. And unlike the European system of human rights, in Latin America, the cases or, or the the representatives of victims go to the Inter-American Commission first. They can't go directly to the to the Inter-American Court. They go to, to the Inter-American Commission first. And the Inter-American Commission, after a process and uh, steps and many requirements, presents the cases to the uh, Inter-American Court. So it is understandable that both the Commission and the Inter-American Court want to take advantage uh, or to harness the, the circumstances of, of every case to make a bigger a broad impact uh, rather than to focus on the on the individual victims of, in each case. So it is very expensive to litigate and, and human rights courts while well, they have to to take into account time and, and resources that it takes to litigate at, at, at a regional level, not only domestic, but at a regional level is very, is very complex. So that's why sometimes or many times in terms of court, uh, more than the European, but still the, the Inter-American Court um, orders and uh, measures of non-repetition. And I'm running out of time. I just will say something very short, very brief about the remedial fail failure and compliance. And besides, or, or apart from the um, Declaration Plus, which is developed in the book, um, in the case of uh, enforcement of, of remedies of decision by Inter-American Court, the court always retains jurisdiction and Sometimes uh, every, I don't know, it's years or, yeah, it's usually around five years or, or every case changes. But the states, um, but the intermediate court have received or hears uh, the, the report from the from states about the enforcement of those remedies. So it monitors the enforcement. So that retention of jurisdiction is very helpful. It's very hard uh, and heavy on the court, but um, it allows the court to monitor them and it triggers a lot of process domestically for domestic actors. They have a remedy from the American court, so they have they can litigate that before domestic domestic courts. So I will close now uh, by repeating again that the book provides like a, a very interesting discussion, not only for domestic law, but in my case, I received it like that's a, an important contribution to understanding the practice of remedies and the law of remedies in the in human rights law. Thank you, Julian, very much. Um, given your presentation on the inter-American system, I really need to acknowledge uh, Professor Tracy Robinson, who's in the audience. She uh, was a former member of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and is at the law faculty of the University of West Indies. And luckily for us at the University of Toronto, she taught an intensive course this January on issues uh, regarding sexual orientation and gender identity. So Tracy, wonderful to have you on board and maybe you can uh, respond in the question period. Now we'll uh, move over to Payam Akhavan who is gonna take us uh, further into the international realm. Payam, over to you. Um, thank you, uh, Rebecca, um, uh, dear colleagues. I want to begin by congratulating my dear friend and distinguished colleague, uh, uh, Professor Roach for an elegant and erudite work um, on a neglected subject. And I'm certain that in the coming years, it will become an authoritative source for many scholars and practitioners. Uh, and it's of the same excellent quality that I've come to expect of uh, all of his uh, other works. I'll begin with um, the observation at the outset of the book that the world is rich in rights, but poor in remedies. And in the context of international human rights law, that poverty is a built-in structural weakness. And it's rooted foremost in the fact that the horizontally structured state-centric international legal order is such that enforcement mechanisms that can actually provide effective remedies are either non-existent or otherwise uh, very weak and fragile. 
dependent on the willingness of states to comply with their obligations. And um, um, uh, corollary to that is my observation that uh, perhaps uh, remedies are a neglected subject because scholars are too busy trying to explain how and why international law is law. Um, uh, and one thinks of Thomas Frank's theory of uh, legitimacy that each rule of international law uh, exerts greater or lesser uh, influence um, based on the pull to compliance, uh, which is a theme that you also explore when you speak about jurisprudential uh, persuasion. And the question is how that same consideration would apply to uh, remedies, uh, whether or not courts uh, and tribunals are ambitious or not. I, I want to make also further observation that there is no correlation between the willingness of states to uh, ratify treaties and their compliance with those uh, treaties. It's something that uh, may appear obvious, but sh uh, I believe it's something that should be mentioned. So for example, uh, it was the paradox during the Cold War that um, uh, countries like the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia had the uh, most extensive record of uh, treaty ratification um, compared uh, to uh, Western liberal states. And of course, we know that the, the reality of compliance was uh, something very different. So um, this brings me to what Professor Roach refers to as uh, jurisprudence of persuasion, um, that, and that persuasion, that compliance pull to refer back to Thomas Frank is most effective uh, with liberal states that are least likely to violate human rights. So for example, um, uh, this applies in respect of rational actor models among uh, liberal states where compliance is a byproduct of domestic politics or in respect of normative models, um, it applies to let's say the transnational legal process model where compliance occurs uh, because norms are internalized already within the domestic legal order. So bearing this in mind, I want to focus my remarks on remedies in the context of transitional justice, this being the focus of my own scholarship. Uh, and of course, in sharp contrast to uh, liberal states, uh, which are characterized by habitual uh, lawfulness, uh, transitional justice occurs in the context of mass atrocities, where instead of the internalization of human rights norms, there is an inverted morality which uh, glorifies uh, violence, uh, demonization of the other as an expression of uh, group solidarity or, or heroism. So the question is, how should we grapple with remedies in such aberrant contexts as distinct from the uh, uh, liberal uh, model? A prevalent view is that there are four pillars to transitional justice, uh, namely criminal justice, uh, truth, reparations, and institutional reform. And for the most part, those would fall into the second track um, uh, of the two tracks that you have uh, addressed, but I will explain that the relationship is actually rather complex. But I would like to focus for this uh, brief remark on reparations for moral injury, even if we might be inclined to consider such even if we're inclined to consider reparations for material injury as the greater priority because it is more tangible, more likely to exact the cost, and therefore more effective, arguably, in achieving a deterrence and the like. In particular, I, I would like to briefly explore the significance of uh, declaratory judgments and uh, other modalities of truth telling in addressing moral injury and reflect on why this seemingly least of remedies is likely to be underestimated from the vantage point of states with uh, viable legal systems and why it is especially important in the context of transitional justice where judicial process and other accountability mechanisms play a vital role in achieving a, a wider systemic post-conflict uh, transformation. So, uh, getting back to the scale and gravity of human rights violations in such contexts, the, there, there is a fundamental failure, obviously, of the state in uh, respecting the rule of law. So 
uh, systemic uh, remedies would invariably eclipse individual remedies. Um, and the systemic remedies must address fundamental transformation, not only of laws and institutions, uh, but also of culture and social mores. Um, so in this respect, there is a close relationship between uh, criminal justice, truth, uh, reparations, and institutional reforms, and in particular, the expressive function of uh, high profile uh, trials or uh, truth commissions in establishing authoritative accounts of truth with a view to opening a space for challenging what are awful, uh, 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 often hateful uh, official narratives and reversing the dehumanization of uh, victim uh, populations. And without such a, a moral reckoning, uh, it's very difficult to achieve any form of material reparation or to consolidate democratic institutions and the rule of law. Now, um, turning from those general remarks to uh, declaratory judgments as a remedy, uh, of course, uh, a classical instance is the uh, International Court of uh, justice is finding in the Corfu Channel case back in 1949 regarding the uh, British Navy's mine sweeping operations in Albanian territorial uh, waters, which constituted a violation of Albanian sovereignty. So the court held that this declaration is in itself appropriate satisfaction. So declaratory judgments are closely linked to satisfaction as a, a remedy. But of course, um, uh, an uh, since a declaration by an international court and tribunal is uh, intrinsic to the determination of a case, it is not necessarily uh, a form of satisfaction. It's simply an expression of the judicial function. But in the human rights context, the line between the two is uh, often blurred. So for example, um, in uh, Varvana versus Turkey, uh, before the European Court of Human Rights, the court uh, uh, noted that its jurisprudence often refers to public vindication of the wrong suffered by the applicant in a judgment binding on a contracting state as a powerful form of redress in itself. Uh, and this is a prevalent theme in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. So an important aspect of reparation uh, of moral injury is the so-called um, right to truth. Um, and uh, although this can be achieved through declaratory judgments, uh, it could also be achieved through other means, such as uh, investigations, uh, truth commissions, and the like. Um, and there's considerable emphasis on uh, the right to know in some of the soft law instruments that you also refer to in your book, the UN set of principles for the protection and, protect pr protection and promotion of uh, human rights through uh, action to combat impunity, the basic principles and guidelines on the right to a remedy and reparation for victims, um, which was adopted by the General Assembly in 2005. So all of these refer to the right to learn the truth. And they note that the verification of facts in and of itself and full public disclosure of the truth is a necessary and integral part of reparation for, uh, uh, in particular for serious uh, forms of human rights abuses. Um, of course, uh, these are soft law instruments, but the case law, in fact, goes back to 1983, the case of uh, Quinteros versus uh, Uruguay before the Human Rights Committee, which found not only that the victim's rights had been violated in respect of her uh, disappearance and presumed death, but also recognized the anguish and stress caused to, to her mother. Uh, by the disappearance of her uh, daughter and by the continuing uncertainty concerning her fate and, and whereabouts. And uh, in that uh, seminal case, the committee held that the author had the right to know, the right to know what has happened to her uh, daughter. Um, it's notable that uh, that finding was rooted in the prohibition of torture, cruel or inhuman treatment in Article 7 of uh, ICCPR, whereas more recently in uh, uh, the case of Sadun versus Algeria in 2005, uh, 
the committee has begun to root the uh, right to know or the right to truth in Article 2, Paragraph 3 of ICCPR uh, as an effective remedy, where it is now uh, has found a, a home. So turning to the context of mass atrocities, the surfacing of uh, historical truth, reckoning uh, with, with the past, takes on uh, an additional uh, significance uh, as a remedy. Uh, you refer towards the end of your book to uh, Upendra uh, uh, Bakshi, uh, who says that remedies, perhaps more than rights, can be responsive to the voices of suffering and the lived and embodied experience of violated peoples. So this uh, calls to mind the central importance of uh, truth-telling, uh, whether it is in the context of adjudication or other quasi-judicial procedures, uh, as a means for collective healing and reconciliation, the restoration and transformation of communal ties uh, and belonging, uh, and in this context, uh, remedies such as declaratory judgments, which may be seen as the least of remedies because they're nothing more than a determination uh, in respect of a fact and law, uh, but uh, declaratory judgments and other modalities for surfacing the truth uh, may in fact be the most fundamental form of uh, reparation for uh, uh, injuries, which may be more important than the other remedies that we would consider to have uh, more teeth, uh, uh, if you like. So I'm going to end simply by uh, thanking Professor Roach once again for an excellent book that opens the door uh, for a conversation on the significance uh, for victims of human rights violations of uh, remedies, all their different contexts in which remedies have to be um, considered. And uh, I believe this is a book that will help uh, shift the focus away from um, our perhaps obsession with abstract norms to how uh, judicial and quasi-judicial procedures can have meaningful impacts on uh, victims who are the intended beneficiaries uh, of those norms. So thank you once again and congratulations on an uh, excellent uh, work. Thank you, Payam, very much. Um, Payam mentioned several cases, and I just want to point out that there is an extension. Thank you, freezing there, Rebecca. Thanks. Maybe I'll, I'll stop the video. Can you hear me now? Yes I, yes, I just but, wanted to say that the book is encyclopedic in some in many, many ways. It's got a bibliography for each chapter. It's got a remarkable table of cases. Those tables that Piam, those cases that Piam referred to um, are in the table of cases. Um, so it's a very useful book, not only for academic research, but for practitioners as well. Um, so now we're going to turn it over to Professor Roach for a response to these four very insightful uh, comments on the book. Kent, over to you. Well, thank you very much. And, and you know, first of all, I'd like to thank my four interlocutors for such uh, uh, kind and, uh, and thoughtful uh, comments. Uh, I'd like to thank both uh, the Asper Center and the International uh, uh, Human Rights Center, uh, Rebecca, uh, Cheryl, and Tao uh, for organizing this. Um, I think it is significant that uh, it's the so-called non-academic part of the university that uh, has organized this. And I'd like to thank all of you uh, for taking some of your Friday afternoon uh, uh, to think about uh, uh, remedies. Um, I'm just going to start, I think, uh, at the back uh, with Payam. I mean, I mean, thank you so much uh, for your close reading of the book. Um, you're so right that, you know, the book probably could have been improved by looking at truth-telling as a remedy. 
and as a form of satisfaction. And I was so happy that you referred uh, to the UN basic principles on a right to a remedy uh, uh, approved in 2005, uh, coming up for uh, uh, building on the work of the International Law Commission that Julian uh, mentioned. I have to say that as a domestic lawyer, uh, reading those uh, were really a breath of fresh air. And in fact, I mean, one of the underlying ideas in the book is that it is precisely because international law has struggled with remedies that I think domestic uh, lawyers and, and human rights lawyers uh, should pay more attention uh, to how international law acknowledges uh, the failure of remedies and lack of compliance and how international law is often creative and uses expressive or persuasive uh, forms of remedies. So for domestic uh, litigators, uh, I would you know, really commend you to read those seven pages of the basic principles when you're starting litigation or starting any sort of campaign uh, and figure out what exactly it is that you want, uh, because I do think we need to address uh, what Brenda mentioned is that, you know, sometimes we're so concentrated on winning the case, establishing a rights violation, uh, uh, beating off the government on reasonable limits, that we sometimes forget uh, what it is we want to achieve. And of course, you know, in Canada, with the suspended declaration of invalidity, um, you now almost need two teams. You need a team to win in court, uh, but you also need a team uh, to follow up uh, during the period of the suspended declaration of invalidity. That was certainly the lesson of both uh, Bedford and, uh, and Carter. Um, Payam, um, uh, also thank you for uh, pointing out the uh, importance of declarations uh, that although they may seem like the least of remedies, in some ways uh, they can be extremely uh, powerful. Uh, and of course, here again, I think domestic lawyers owe a lot uh, to international lawyers. And, and actually one of the you know, uh, uh, most fun I had writing the book was uh, uh, doing a little bit of intellectual history on Edwin Borchett, uh, who's a real hero of mine uh, for many reasons, uh, very uh, broad uh, scholar, uh, not as well known, I think, as he perhaps should be. Uh, but um, he was really the one who argued that domestic lawyers uh, should allow, uh, should, should, should uh, embrace declarations instead of injunctions borrowing from international international law. And so his book on declaratory judgments, uh, the first uh, um, uh, uh, edition was in the 30s, is really quite responsible for Crown Liability Acts in much of the Anglo uh, uh, common law world, allowing for declarations as opposed to injunctions uh, against the Crown. So I, I very much uh, here am following in the footsteps of Professor Borchett, and I see the Declaration Plus as a way to perhaps marry uh, his uh, 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 very important idea about the importance of declarations uh, with Abram Chases, also a scholar who bridged both of these worlds, idea of having continuing jurisdiction uh, over a case uh, as the Declaration Plus um, uh, tries to promote, but does so in a way that I think is more respectful of the separation of powers domestically, 
and ideas of subsidiarity uh, in uh, supranational law. So although I, I had the honor and was influenced by studying with Owen Fisk, uh, I've always admired uh, uh, Chase's work uh, because it reflects, uh, I think, both uh, um, uh, the jurisprudential insight to see that we are, uh, uh, that there was something like public law litigation, which looks a lot more like international law litigation, where courts, even if they're much uh, less well staffed than domestic courts, international courts like the Inter American. Court of Human Rights uh, retain jurisdiction uh, for uh, uh, a long time. And so, uh, uh, you know, if you bring Borchett and uh, Chase together, uh, that explains much uh, of the Declaration Plus. Um, I also want to just talk a little bit about the two-track approach. Uh, my good friend, John Burroughs, who always has more faith that I have a coherent view uh, of life than I do, uh, on one of our talks said, well, you know, you have to bring all your work together. And of course, the two-track approach is, is not rocket science. It's not even my own. Uh, it borrows, of course, from Chase, uh, private law, public law, uh, litigation, uh, the distinction in international law between specific measures and general measures. Uh, but it also probably reflects some of my own experience working on many public inquiries where, you know, following Payam's insight, uh, the first job is uh, to tell the truth, often in a way uh, that recognizes the voices of the suffer suffering, uh, whether it was Air India uh, uh, or, uh, or uh, Arar or Epperwash. Uh, and the second track is, of course, to try uh, to ensure uh, that such wrongs are, uh, are, um, are not uh, re repeated. Um, Julian, thank you very much uh, for your thoughtful comments. Um, um, thank you for, uh, for having uh, 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 some faith in proportionality as a remedial concept. I will come to Brenda's uh, uh, very important comments as, as well. And I know that my colleague David Beatty is in the audience. So, uh, you know, proportionality, uh, as I thought about it, uh, of course, I, I thought and borrowed both from the work of, of David and Aron Barak, uh, who both encouraged me in, uh, in uh, that pursuit. Um, uh, I think as Julian points out, uh, the burden on the government, I think, is an important um, uh, uh, point. Uh, I'm enough of a proceduralist uh, to believe that burdens uh, 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 still count. And also a way, I think, to deal with what Bob Sharp points out uh, is, you know, the problem of kind of polycentric uh, uh, problems. So the idea of proportionality is there, again, borrowing from Bob this time uh, with the idea of disciplining uh, remedial decision making. So, you know, one of the one of the frustrations uh, that I think both Bob and I have uh, share as scholars of remedies is when judgments uh, run out of steam and it looks just like a matter of uh, you know remedial discretion in almost a, 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 a coin flipping sort of way. So I propose proportionality as a way. Uh, to structure uh, that. Uh, but having said that, um, I hear uh, and I take very seriously what Brenda is saying, is that proportionality has not always worked uh, for those who have uh, suffered. And I think about a conversation that I had with Bob, uh, 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 Bob Elliott, uh, a great litigator who did the Heslop case. And, um, you know, Bob, like Brenda, uh, I think is skeptical 
of proportionality reasoning for, for good reason, uh, in Hislop, uh, the Supreme Court decided only to give remedies for same-sex couples retroactive to 1999, whereas uh, Bob's uh, 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 our, our argument was uh, uh, they should be retroactive to 1985 because that is when equality rights came into uh, 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 w w came into force under uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Canadian uh, Charter. I guess one of my hopes for proportionality analysis uh, that, that I try to make clear in the book uh, is that that final balancing stage will often favor uh, the most disadvantage because it really requires uh, the court to look at the actual effects and uh, you know the the you know the the thing that uh, always has made me mad uh, one of the cases that has made me the most mad uh, since the day I was a law student was a decision of the Quebec Court of Appeal in overturning an injunction against the James Bay Hydro development, where they simply said, you know, it's it's the interest of the people of Quebec in hydroelectricity against the interest of a few thousand Creek. Uh, and I fairly early on, uh, I think, described that as crudely majoritarian, uh, uh, racist, uh, and colonial. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, you may very well be right, Brenda, uh, but uh, what I was trying to do is set up something wh where uh, that sort of injustice uh, never occurs again. And to go back to Payam, of course, the James Bay, uh, uh, and, and to go back to dialogue, uh, that episode also shows that Justice Maloof's uh, uh, first injunction, even though it was overturned very quickly, stayed pending appeal and then overturned on its merits by the Quebec Court of Appeal, actually captured the imagination of, uh, of many and played a large role in the James Bay uh, Agreement, which while not perfect, was one of our first uh, um, um, modern um, um, treaties. Um, the last thing I'd like to say before we open it up to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, some other questions is, uh, uh, Bob, thank, thank you so much. Uh, uh, for your comments. Um, uh, uh, I've learned a lot uh, from you over the years. Um, I would only add that I do think that judges can do a little bit more in track one remedies to explore track two simply by asking and considering as a mitigating factor whether the government has taken reasonable steps to uh, prevent the repetition of the violation. So I think that under section 24.2, exclusion of evidence and in damages, uh, given that uh, we've recognized vindication and deterrence as well as compensation as legitimate um, um, I, 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 uh, goals. Uh, I, I think much can be gained simply by looking at that as a mitigating f uh, factor and allowing the government or at least giving an incentive to the government to say what, if anything, they have done. Uh, because, you know, as always, uh, you're very candid and honest and you say, Unfortunately, what I think not all domestic judges do uh, is that there is a lack of full compliance. I think too many uh, government lawyers and too many judges just assume uh, that a declaration uh, solves everything, even in the face of things like the Little Sisters um, uh, debacle. And then finally, just kind of ending, uh, a number of you, including Bob, uh, uh, talked about um, remedies being neglected. And so I, I want to end on something about kind of the epistemology of remedies. Bet, bet you didn't know I, I, I knew such a big word. I mean, to me, 
uh, the penny dropped, and again, I have Bob Sharp to thank, when he persuaded uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin uh, to give a keynote speech in a conference uh, we organized called Taking Remedies Seriously. And it was only when, you know, someone who is, you know, uh, now our longest serving Chief Justice, um, and when she spoke, I realized that I wasn't the only insecure person. I wasn't the only imposter uh, uh, in the room because she talks about remedies being neglected. And, uh, and uh, she says, uh, you know, that she was forced to teach remedies as a young female law professor because all the other big subjects and import, more important subjects were taken. And she writes, yet I be began to positively enjoy remedies. They are practical and down to earth. They related to real people and real problems. Remedies flow inevitably from the experience of human, human, human beings. Uh, they heal us, they heal wounds, they put things right. Remedies allow us to mend our wounds and carry on as individuals and as a society. And, you know, in a world that unfortunately uh, um, matches the brooding Monet uh, painting, uh, that's the best part of the book, uh, in a world where uh, what is happening now in the Ukraine, what is happening to Indigenous people, what is happening with climate change uh, um, uh, uh, is going on. I really think we have no other alternative uh, but to uh, delve into the remedial mindset, uh, my, mindset uh, to try remedies, to recognize that remedies will, will often fail, but then try again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for um, really a lot of food for thought. We have um, so far, only one question, and we don't have very much time for questions, but that's fine. Um, I'm going to read it out just for the sake of the um, uh, the recording. And it's a question from Alexis Contos. I'm wondering whether Professor Roach has considered the applicability of his two-track framework to statutory human rights systems in Canada. Arguably, these systems have had greater engagement with the interaction between these two, individual and systemic. Um, tracks which well could well be due to their greater quasi-constitutional remedial, remedial flexibility as well as their particular equality rights focus um, so I'm, I'm not going to read all of it but but references being made specifically to the first nations child and family caring society case uh, as well as the moore case at the supreme court of canada as to the um, different evidence and pleadings required for determining appropriate individual and systemic remedies um, that raise important considerations with respect to your proportionality approach. So if you could maybe address yes. this question. Yeah, no, if no, anyone else thanks. has a question, um, yeah. please type it into the chat or raise your hand. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Alex, and it's a very good question. Um, I probably haven't followed those remedies as closely as I should, but I would note that with the um, uh, child welfare case, uh, you see a couple of things. One is the bifurcation of right and remedies. So I think that human rights tribunals, there's a recent uh, Canadian human rights decision uh, basically finding the same discriminatory funding of First Nations police services as was found uh, with First Nations uh, child, child welfare. Um, uh, 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 systems. And so I think that this bifurcation of right and remedy uh, can both be um, uh, a good thing and can also be a bad thing, because it does, I think, talk about this you know, um, uh, that rights are too often seen as, you know, what it's all about. And so, you know, uh, we proudly, you know, often uh, report uh, findings of rights violations, but then as in uh, in uh, the uh, uh, child and, and caring society, we ignore the fact that there's like 14 decisions documenting forms of non-compliance. Uh, so um, 
I think that you know one of my messages is that you need a lot of uh, uh, stamina uh, to keep up with long running remedies and and you know it may be that human rights tribunals, even though in some ways they're not as funded as well as domestic courts are better at doing that. And so, you know, part of the book is kind of saying to our domestic courts, retain jurisdiction, why don't you? Uh, because if, you know, a poorly funded court like the San Jose court can retain jurisdiction, and if a human rights tribunal can retain jurisdiction, why can't the superior courts that are, you know, always going to be a Around and have a constitutionally guaranteed remedial uh, jurisdiction. Um, second, and this relates, you know, to my chapter on Indigenous rights, I also think that we need to be attentive, especially in the Indigenous rights context, but really I think in all contexts, between uh, the remedies that the court can or will impose and the ability of those whose rights are violated to participate in shaping their own remedy. Uh, and here I you know, go back to Derek Bell's uh, wonderful 1975 article where you know, after uh, litigating uh, school desegregation cases often focused on busing, uh, when he went into academe and was you know, one of the founders of critical race theory, uh, he really worried that he had served two masters, that he had served the institutional master of the interest group in pursuing busing remedies and perhaps had not given enough attention to what uh, parents uh, on the ground wanted for their children as an effective remedy to the racial segregation of schools. And so I think that you know, one of the things we need to think about is how do you combine those, those two? And whether it's the duty to consult or the South African engagement remedy, uh, I think that we need to create space for participation. We need to create space for indigenous law as Brenda has outlined, uh, which is part of the demarcation process. And in fact, Article 40 of UNDRIP uh, talks about by jural remedies that will respect human rights and will respect in uh, indigenous law. But I think more generally, we have to think about how uh, courts uh, should listen uh, respectfully to remedial requests by those who are actually going to have to live with the remedies. So thank you very much for the question. I think Rebecca has Rebecca her hand has up. Her hand up. Yes. Go ahead, Rebecca. And building upon your chapter on social and economic rights and remedies in that realm, I'm wondering if you've given any thought to the European Social Charter and its approach uh, to systemic remedies. As you know, that approach doesn't require it, an NGO can bring a claim for example, I'm thinking of the Women's University um, case where they brought a case against several countries for gaps in wages, um, the persistent gaps in um, differential wages between men and women. So the focus there was coming up exclusively with systemic remedies without an actual individual plaintiff. So they're taking exclusively your second track approach Yep. And I'm wondering what your prediction will be for that committee, which is turning out some fascinating decisions. They, uh, they require evidence on both sides um, from the NGOs and the government. And it's, a, it, it's, it's very judicial in its approach. And some of the uh, declarations are very, very useful to the NGOs as litigants. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I, 
I'm a bit skeptical about any remedial approach that is exclusively individual or exclusively systemic. Um, you know, I think a lot obviously depends upon the context and that may be a very good committee. But I worry about some of the things I'm reading in India about purely systemic uh, 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 public law litigation that tends to be taken over uh, by uh, institutional interests, whether it's of uh, a well-meaning interest groups or amicus curiae's uh, often retired judges. I have, I have to put that in just to tease Bob. Um, uh, but um, uh, so, so I actually think that you really do need both. And, you know, I think in a dialogic view, people still respond to the catharsis of, uh, of uh, an individual person, even if, if that will be inevitably partial and in the socioeconomic rights context will be seen as uh, perhaps uh, cue jumping. So I think about, and you would know this area much better than I, Rebecca, but I think about the approach that was taken with respect to abortion rights in Ireland, that you might think that the individual remedies for individual women who had to leave Ireland in order to obtain an abortion are, you know, remedial failures. I mean, obviously, it's not going to make up. But I do think it is important uh, for uh, all of us to see that real people are affected and to kind of bring that down. And, and yes, there, 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 there may be thousands or millions of other real people behind that. So, you know, but having to said that, um, you know, part of remedies is, is, you know, the proof is in the pudding and the eating of, of, of the pudding and the Indian right to food litigation, uh, which also was done almost entirely systemically, uh, seems to have saved uh, thousands of lives. Uh, so, you know, I would not want to say never, but also having been involved in at least one case, and Cheryl uh, and I were co-counsel on this, uh, where there was only a request for a systemic remedy. Uh, that was also a very influential case that I was able to litigate for the Asper Center many years ago uh, uh, that convinced me of the two-track approach. So, so just to end up, uh, another influence in the two-track approach is my non-academic work with the legal aid clinics here that we're most fortunate to have at the University of Toronto. So thank you. I think that comes to a close now. We don't have any further questions and we don't have any further time. I really want to thank um, everyone, um, the discussants who brought um, the sort of domestic law um, into perspective. Um, with respect to this book, um, and as well as the international perspective. I know that uh, I have, um, long, in my teaching at the, at the clinic um, for the Asper Center, I, um, the constitutional remedies book that um, Kent uh, is known for is my go-to. And when I tell students, you, when we're um, devising what we shall do um, in a, any kind of case is to start with the remedy, actually. What is it you want to get and achieve before you start looking at the analysis of the law, really, in the other areas? And I'm, I'm delighted to have another book that expands that and allows us to, um, as a good resource, to go to um, international examples of how we can um, actually fulfill systemic um, remedies as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for um, your thoughtful comments today and, and, and for the interesting questions that we had. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for participating.